so the New Zealand and Defence Force might have to start thinking about, well, what new capabilities might we need if we're going to play a part alongside Australia with an ANZUS? And that could mean, for example, expanding naval capabilities beyond what you have now. And it could mean reconstituting your um, air combat capabilities that you let go when you lost the Skyhawk some years yeah. ago. I, I hate to break it to this guy, but we're going to have to do a lot of expanding. <laughs> like we've got a yeah. long way to go before we can protect ourselves. I think that New Zealand, is uh, like Australia, is going to have to bite the bullet and recognise that you need to spend more on defence and be prepared to have a more muscular role in the region alongside the United States. OK, can I ask you, is... Whoa. Is, wow. You talk wow. about the about the Thucydides trap. Is push going to come to shove at some stage in the not-too-distant? The US will be forced to stand up for Taiwan or Japan or the Philippines in the South China Sea or admit defeat and diminish as a power. What do you think? Absolutely. I think that, well, you're already seeing it in terms of the Korean Peninsula. But in terms of Taiwan, I think the US can't accept the prospect of China overrunning uh, Taiwan, uh, which is essentially a, a peaceful Western liberal democracy. Uh, you can't see China uh, being allowed to overrun that country. Or that that's, depending on how you want to phrase it, I mean, I know there's a one China, two system and so forth, but, but you can't see Taiwan be subjugated under Chinese military attack. So I think that the US will be required to intervene on Taiwan's side if that were to happen. In the South China Sea, uh, I think that there's a pr key principle at stake there in terms of the US preventing China from changing the status quo through force of arms and establishing control of the South China Sea. And both of those contingencies would see Australia and New Zealand having to make some tough choices and stand alongside the US. Indeed. And I, I, I don't really see... Uh, backing out from the ANZUS alliance as being a very uh, sensible move on the part of Australia or New Zealand. All right, and thank you for joining us, Dr Malcolm Davis, on the panel. Well, I was just going to say it was backing out time, but obviously not. He knows more than me. Well, it's nearly <laughs> as backing out time. i just got one more thing, because enough with the real news. We'll just finish with this. I thought we were going to go get on the frigate and go over to Taiwan and sort <laughs> this out. No. It's your job. <laughs> don't, no, don't look at me. I'm, I don't know. I've got an entirely different topic. Uh, media have been investigating the otherworldly beliefs of well-known people, prompted by the Republican con congressional candidate from Florida, Bettina Aguilera, who says she's been in telepathic contact uh, with aliens. No. Smashing Pumpkins frontman Billy Corgan <laughs> says uh, this week in an interview he once encountered a shapeshifter. Wow. I could go on. Has anything happened to you ever <laughs> that seemed to be a blip in the matrix, please? No. Deja vu always no. blows my mind. <laughs> you, you oh, deja, deja vu, vu yes, deja, deja vu, vu always yep. blows my mind. There is a, there is a logical. I've actually had to Google it because it, apparently yeah. it is just something. It's it's more of a mind trick than anything else. But I wouldn't take too much um, heed from Billy Corgan's comments. He did a lot of drugs in the nineties. I don't know if he's quite uh, recovered from that. <laughs> um, well, maybe they see them when they've taken the drugs. Maybe that's the thing. You take the drugs and then you see this paranormal. <laughs> oh, thing. I think you could put two and two together in yeah. that case, though, couldn't mm. you? He claimed he was sober. Um, Jim, you were playing some Smashing Pumpkins before. You're a big Billy Corgan fan. No, that was um, that was Alex playing the Smashing Pumpkins. Have, and have, have you have you have you seen anything uh, any shape shifting or anything like that? No, I've never seen a shape shifter, but it would be an entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> were that to occur. Well, yeah, Harry well, Potter all over again. I, I I would like to see it. I hope hopefully hopefully there's something out there. I'm excited. Very nice to have you make your debut on the panel, Guy Williams. Thank you so much for having me. I loved it. It's a pleasure, Leonie Freeman. Very nice to have you on too, as usual. Thanks very much. Great to be here. Have a great long weekend, everybody. Thank you for your company this week and Sharon is standing by with Checkpoint. Kia ora everyone, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly in for John Campbell and on behalf of our team, welcome to Checkpoint on RNZ National. Tonight, Prime Minister-elect Jacinda Ardern announces her cabinet. She joins us live. Former Prime Minister Helen Clark tells us Ms Ardern's strength during the tense negotiations has proven she has a backbone of steel. Voters in the Mangere electorate tell us they have an overwhelming lack of faith that a change of government will make a difference. Also tonight on Checkpoint, advocates for sexual abuse victims say the global social media campaign Me Too has given a voice to thousands of women who have previously suffered in silence. And a near New Zealand passenger demands answers after a man was allowed to board a flight from Christchurch using her identity. 
RNZ News at 5 o'clock. Good afternoon, I'm Anna Thomas. The presumptive Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has revealed the people who will be in charge of running the country. There are no surprises in the Labour Cabinet, which includes their current lineup of senior MPs, as well as former leader Andrew Little. Here's our political reporter, May Heron. Out of the 16 named, only three have had previous government ministerial experience. Jacinda Ardern says she's not happy with the gender balance of only six female ministers and she will work on bringing through more women into the party and up through the ranks. Despite the ministers being named, their portfolios won't be disclosed until a final sign-off with New Zealand First over the weekend, with an announcement expected early next week. Ms Ardern says she may tweak some existing portfolios. I don't want to split things beyond what they make sense. In some areas I'll look to bring things together, um, but I also want to make sure we put emphasis on the areas that are of great importance to this government. She suggested a new forestry portfolio could be created, as well as a possibility of splitting transport. Ms Ardern will likely have a role in the area of arts and as well as the children's portfolio. Winston Peters has been offered the position of Deputy Prime Minister and New Zealand First will have four Cabinet Ministers in the new government. The Greens will have three Ministers outside Cabinet. From Parliament, May Heron. A senior Māori National Party member and Ngāpui leader says he's not sad the New Zealand First Leader has formed a government with the Labour Party. Rihari Dargaville says he's proud Winston Peters decided to go with the will of the people for a change of government. He also says National is to blame for the current socio-economic state of Māori. To pursue policies that really go against the grain or the will of the people out there, is not at all acceptable, neither is it sustainable. Though I must say, they've managed the economy very well, but the deprivation of our people is their fault. The Hari Dargaville says MMP is now working in a way it was designed to and allowing smaller parties to have a say in government. The Commerce Commission has told the High Court that traditional media are not as threatened by social media as news managers say. It says there's still a need and a demand for proper researched journalism as produced by the traditional media. Eric Frickberg reports. The comments came as the Commission defended its blocking of a merger that would blend the New Zealand Herald, Dominion Post, the Press, News Talk ZB and others into one giant company. In challenging that ban, Council for the Media said they had to unite night to survive because of powerful competition from new media such as blogs and Facebook. In response, counsel for the Commission said there was no comparison between proper research journalism and media like blogs, which were often opinionated and unreliable. People of all ages, the lawyer said, depended on established media to get their news and this merger would reduce the extent of that. This is Eric Frickberg. A musician whose latest album caused police to shut down much of central Dunedin earlier this year has been cleared of wrongdoing. Dean Barnes appeared in the Dunedin District Court today on a charge of threatening a building. Much of Dunedin CBD was shut down on June the 16th after a package and note referencing firebombing a car and leaking state secrets was found stuck to the wall of an abandoned strip club. The package turned out to be Mr Barnes's latest album, Street Noise. Judge John MacDonald dismissed the police case, saying, taken in context, the note is not a threat and the defendant did not see it as such. Outside court, Mr Barnes told RNZ he's pleased with the outcome. Um, I was obviously very happy and felt vindicated. And I think that they overreact overreacted and misinterpreted. Dean Barnes says the note was a poem about homelessness. Fire crews are still working to contain an uncontrolled burn-off near Tiano in Southland, which is now understood to be 800 hectares in size. They were alerted to the blaze on the side of Mount Prospect just after 2 o'clock this afternoon. A fire and emergency spokesperson says six helicopters are being used to fight the fire as the terrain is difficult. The spokesperson says while the fire is a significant size, it's not threatening any buildings and crews are working to put in containment lines. Lucky Masterton motorists are filling up at the Gull petrol station yesterday got a very good deal when the local franchisee accidentally dropped the regular 91 petrol price to 17 cents a litre. 
less than a tenth of the usual price. A spokesman for the company, Rohan Mehta, says it was meant to be a price drop of 10 cents a litre ahead of Labour weekend, but the low, low price stayed in place for about 25 minutes. He says it was a bit of an oops moment, but at least it brought a smile to a few faces. Mr Mehta says that while several other oil companies have raised their prices by two cents ahead of the long weekend, Gull is holding steady until Tuesday. It's five past five. New Zealand motor racing driver Brendan Hartley says he's been seeking plenty of advice ahead of his Formula One debut this weekend. 27-year-old Hartley is about to fulfil a childhood dream of racing an F1 when he lines up for the Toro Rosso in the US Grand Prix in Austin. Hartley admits he's taken every opportunity to talk to F1 drivers, including one of his mentors, Mark Webber. All the friends I have in the sport, I've been asking for a bit of advice. I saw Mark this morning for, for breakfast and uh, one of my best buddies as well, Daniel Ricciardo. So he, I saw him two nights ago. I asked him all the advice I could manage to get out of him regarding tyres. And I mean, some of it's going to come down to driving free practice one, seeing how I go and then asking some of those questions. A lot of them aren't really relevant until I've actually experienced the, the car. Brendan Hartley. First practice is tomorrow with the race itself on Monday morning New Zealand time. New Zealand golfer Lydia Ko has slipped back at the start of her second round in the latest LPGA Tour event in Taipei. Four holes through, Ko has dropped to a tie for eighth place, four shots behind the leaders. New Zealand Rugby has announced a deal with Sky to live stream the All Blacks upcoming matches against the UK Barbarians and a France 15, along with the Māori All Blacks matches against Canada and the French Barbarians as pay-per-view events. The November games will be streamed on allblackstv.com at a cost of $25 per All Blacks game and $15 for Māori All Blacks games. Stephen Adams, Oklahoma Thunder have opened their NBA season with a convincing 105-84 to home win over the New York Knicks. And that's the news. Tonight on Nights, we are gearing up for the Paikakariki Pride Parade, possibly the shortest Pride Parade in the world. Alex Bean follows Martin Phillips around his Dunedin musical haunts. Country Life meets the hearts. Holistic farmers from the Hawke's Bay and samples of a bit of poo power as in cow pats. And we have a sonic tonic dedicated to materialism. So join me, Brian Crump, for a bit of late night shopping after the news at seven on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to Midnight tomorrow. Northland and Auckland, mostly cloudy with a few light showers. Uh, western areas from Waikato to Wellington, also Coromandel Bay of Plenty in the central high country. Mostly fine, but isolated showers about Waikato and the Bay of Plenty. Cloudier tomorrow with light showers in the west and a spell of rain in the evening or at night. Gisborne and Hawke's Bay, a few showers north of Napier, but fine tomorrow. Wider upper Marlborough and Nelson fine, but a few afternoon or evening showers tomorrow, especially in the west. Buller and Westland, mostly cloudy, rain developing tomorrow morning and then easing to showers in the afternoon. Canterbury and Otago fine, but showers developing tomorrow morning, but they will clear later on. Southland and Fiordland rain tonight and tomorrow morning, then clearing, but scattered rain returns late tomorrow night. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. RNZ National, it's eight minutes past five, and you're listening to Checkpoint with Sharon Brett Kelly. Kia ora, good evening, and welcome to Checkpoint. As Anna said, I'm Sharon Brett Kelly, in for John Campbell. Jacinda Ardern has made her first big reveal as presumptive Prime Minister, naming the people who will run the country. The 16 Cabinet Ministers include Labour's current lineup of senior MPs, as well as former leader Andrew Little. However, their portfolios won't be disclosed until a final sign-off with New Zealand First and the Green Party early next week. Ms Ardern has also named five ministers outside Cabinet, which includes the only new Labour MP, Willie Jackson. Well, Jacinda Ardern joins us now live on the phone. Good evening and congratulations. Good evening. Thank you very much. So you've announced your Cabinet ministerial lineup, but when will we know who gets what? Oh, look, I anticipate making that announcement on Wednesday next week. How many of your Cabinet have ministerial experience? We're counting only three have previous govern government experience. How much of a handicap is that going to be? 
Oh, look, we've got both um, the advantage of having a uh, fresh new lineup, uh, although uh, keeping in mind, of course, a number of those MPs have upwards of nine years of parliamentary experience as well. Um, but we do have equally um, those who have had cabinet experience before, the likes of um, Damien O'Connor, um, the likes of David Parker, Nanaya Mahuta. Um, we also have um, the experience of uh, people like Trevor Mallard and Ruth Dyson supporting Labour and other roles. So uh, for us, it's about making sure we balance that experience, utilise that experience, uh, but also make use of the uh, range of talents and ideas that exist within our front bench and senior team. David Clark is on that list, so he must be a shoe in for Health Minister. Oh, certainly there's um, a, a lot of speculative um, comments that could be made that in many cases will probably be pretty accurate. Um, but I, I need to go through the process uh, of looking uh, at where those um, portfolios make the most of the experience those individuals bring, um, whilst also um, integrating the work that ministers um, from New Zealand First and the Green Party will undertake uh, as well. It's quite a it's quite a job. Um, the portfolio portfolio allocation. It's a, a bit like a game of Jenga, but I'm I'm absolutely committed to making sure I use the talent and experience I have to the best uh, of those individuals' abilities. Will you break up some of those portfolios? MB, for example, it's it's pretty huge. The transport portfolio. I think you mentioned that. Yes, yes. Look, there are elements of some of these portfolios where I will be looking um, to maximise what we gain from them. A, a good example, we've already announced, for instance, uh, that we want a separate forestry service. A huge amount of emphasis you'll see from this government uh, on using forestry as a tool for um, employment, regional economic development, but also our climate change goals. So uh, extra emphasis in that area of work. Uh, and you'll see other areas where, where that we want to do that will make Make sure that we have those separate portfolios, but not an unreasonable level. There's some breakups that I think just don't make sense. And what about your own role as a minister? Yeah, I've been very um, uh, focused in my entire term in, uh, in Parliament on issues particularly that relate uh, to child wellbeing. Uh, and so alongside uh, the traditional um, expectation uh, that a Prime Minister takes a role um, in uh, intelligence and security issues, I'll also be looking to satisfy my real, real desire to um, play a lead role in the work we do around child wellbeing. I have to exercise some caution there as Prime Minister. I can't take on uh, a role that really has too much of an operational arm as in the way that Oranga Tamariki, um, our uh, new version of Child, Youth and Family does. So I'll be taking um, strong advice on how best to arrange uh, that work. You have six out of 16 of those ministers and cabinet w uh, women. Mm. You're not happy with that. You've already said that. But how would you change it? Oh, well, look, it's all about, as in any workplace, it's all about the work that you do to lay the foundation uh, for women to be coming into those opportunities in the first place, making sure that the support is there, um, that we're identifying that talent early and bringing them in a position uh, for those for those individuals to move up through the ranks. Um, we set ourselves the goal as a Labour Party because it's, it's after all 2017 that Parliament should reflect our population. Um, and you can't tell me that we shouldn't be able to find uh, 60 women to, to, to enter into, into Parliament of the 120 we have. So we set ourselves a goal that we wanted our own team, our own caucus to reflect the population. Uh, and this time we've brought in 46% of our team are, are women. Um, that then needs to flow on into those senior roles. So look, yes, we do have work to do. I acknowledge that. Uh, I'm committed to, to keep doing that in the future. Has Winston Peters met James Shaw yet? Oh, I, I couldn't speak to the individual meetings that party leaders may or, or may not have had. Do you think they need to meet up soon? Oh, no, I actually think that they, as uh, Mr Peters and Mr Shaw themselves have said, um, they have a, a good working relationship. Uh, there are no issues there and you'd be hard-pressed to find either having um, uh, said anything uh, other than constructive about the other. So I'm absolutely confident having 
conducted negotiations over um, an extensive period over the last few days over a range of issues with both parties, I can tell you I am confident we will have an excellent working relationship collectively. Have you spoken to Bill English today? Uh, no, I spoke with Mr English um, last night. Uh, he uh, was uh, uh, incredibly courteous, gave me a call yesterday uh, evening after uh, the results uh, of the deliberations and negotiations were announced. Uh, he wished me well in my future endeavours uh, and I acknowledged um, the role that he's played in, in the campaign that we had. Um, so certainly yeah, you'll see a, uh, a robust relationship between uh, between our parties in the future, but a real acknowledgement of the contribution that exiting um, ministers, and particularly the Prime Minister, has made. Would you like to see him stay on as the leader of the opposition? Oh, look, he certainly has an incredible amount of experience, um, uh, and I, I cannot fault um, uh, that the experience that he brings to the table. We, of course take very different views um, on uh, where uh, our respective parties, um, our beliefs and where they should be focusing and in terms of the priorities he laid out during the election. Uh, but I, I acknowledge the um, uh, the work that he has done on behalf of New Zealand. Uh, it, is, it is not an easy job being a member of parliament um, uh, at the best of times. Uh, and so I, I respect those who come to this place to do work to the extent that he has. It's not, however, really my decision, um, the roles that different parliamentarians play, but I, I do acknowledge um, the expertise he brings. Has Winston Peters accepted the deputy role yet? It's not something we have had a conversation today. We were covering off a few matters we needed to organise together. Uh, but I anticipate over the weekend that I'll be working through portfolio allocations um, and having a, a further conversation in the future. Uh, it's not something an immediate decision was required of. Of him around, but I mean, why would he not not want to take it? Oh, look, it may well be that um, uh, after such a lengthy period of negotiations, after um, so much time predominantly having been spent on policy discussion, and I can tell you that was where we spent um, almost the entire time uh, on that he may just want to take a bit of time to think about um, portfolios and roles for individuals because that wasn't the thing that, that occupied much time. And so I absolutely respect um, that any leader would want to think about uh, which role suited them best and their team best. So do you expect to hear from him this weekend about that? Oh, yes, I'll certainly be making contact over the weekend as we line up those portfolio allocations. Jacinda Ardern, thanks very much for your time. So how do voters feel about the formation of a new government? Well, today we went to Mangere in South Auckland, which has the most one-sided electorate in the country. 70% of voters gave their party vote to Labour. And what we found in Mangere was an overwhelming lack of faith that anything will change, a complete lack of trust in the political system and the politicians in it, including the Prime Minister-elect Jacinda Ardern. In Mangere Town Centre, 44-year-old Steve told our reporter Zach Fleming what he wants most. Ah, uh, uh, start to, I don't know, start to close the, the, the gap between uh, the haves and the have-nots. Sort of thing. I know it's. I know a lot of people will say, "Well, you know, we're blessed to be in a good economy at the moment." But I think that the gap uh, needs to close. I don't know how they're going to do it. There's a lot of things that we can do from the grassroots level, but hopefully they'll be able to uh, start the ball rolling and get it sorted. She talked a lot about that during the election campaign, right? About yeah. inequality. Yep. Yep. She did. And and you uh, and you know again after nine years of, of uh, national, you hope that they uh, they take these or they look. I mean, uh, that Labour step in a different direction or in a direction that will keep moving it economy as well as social. Talked to quite a few people here today and that word hope is like often used. Do, but do you have faith that she will do the things that she's promised and can do the things she's promised? Um, hope is one thing. But... Yeah, 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 true. And that's true. But that's, that's pretty much what a lot of people around here, that's all they've got is hope. And you've got to hope that, uh, that as they continue to live, that the people that are meant to be uh, looking after them and making the best decisions are doing it not for themselves, but for those people who are just grinding away, so to speak. Yeah. She hasn't got any children, eh? I don't want to... Yeah, well, I, I don't think she'll understand. You know, um, yeah, she, she gets to learn it, but it's, it, 
it's better to get someone who's got children and understand what life is with children in this kind of area. Wait, what do you mean? Can you elaborate a little bit? Like, what is what? So I don't have children. What what do you think I wouldn't be able to well, understand? There's, there's a different um, structure. The way to survive, no, how to survive. You as a single person, you do not know what's going on in the family of ten. You know, couple with ten kids. So that's what they need to do. She needs to understand what's going on in there, be a family person, and then she'll know how to work. Do you think she can fix those kind of issues if she doesn't understand them properly? She has to understand it to fix it. Yeah, requires a lot of insight. I'm Breezy. Breezy. How old are you, Breezy? I'm 20, 28. 28. Have you lived in Mangani most of your life? My whole life. What do you think about the election result, man? Oh, man. I, to be honest, like, if you want my honest opinion... I do, I want your honest opinion. I actually think all the government's the same. But, you know, if it's a better change for our people, then, you know, let's, let's do it. You think it will be a better change for your people? Oh, I don't, man, we've been saying that for years. We'll soon see. Why don't you think anything will change, right? Oh. Man, it's up to us as people to change it, to be honest. It's up to us. So, if, only us people can make that change. If Jacinda could do something, change one thing for you guys, what would be the biggest change that would make the biggest difference for you? Oh man, just get our families off the street, eh? To be honest, like, she said that she's gonna do that for us, eh? Hopefully she gets our families off the streets, and Yeah, man, like... Like poverty, inequality, yeah, those kind of things? Oh man, I don't know, I've been out south all, all my whole life, so, like, I see that stuff all the time. You know, it's just... It's just funny that all that sort of stuff gets arisen around these types of times, if you know what I mean. But, um, man, it's, it's just a normal, everyday life for us out here, our south side. So many people before coming into Parliament say that they're going to change so much and do it all for the better, and they don't. They end up just completely forgetting about it until the next time election time comes around again. Then they bring back the promises, but don't fulfil them. Yeah. So you have hope, but do you have yeah. faith? I have, I have a smaller bit of faith like 50 50 on the faith bit like i would really want her to do it but it just all depends on government now how everything goes whether or not she's going to be like national hopefully she's Bye. a lot better and that report from zach fleming well tongues are wagging around the country as to what changes the new government will bring the only hint we've had so far is that labor's 100 day plan remains mostly intact following coalition talks Labor's long to-do list includes cutting immigration, building more homes and re-entering Pike River Mine. Some kind of ban on foreign buyers purchasing existing houses or land is also looking likely. Sally Murphy filed this report. Prime Minister-designate Jacinda Ardern says she's excited to get the plan into motion. Now, a 100-day plan remains with a few minor changes, but pretty much has remained intact. I will be releasing, though, we're finalising in the next 24 hours, uh, the detail of both agreements. So what is the 100-day plan and how will it affect you and I? Well, it includes introducing legislation to set a child poverty reduction target, resuming contributions to the superannuation fund and stopping the sell-off of state houses. Basically, it covers a wide range of issues. One of the big ones, though, is education. Charter schools and national standards are likely to be early casualties of the new Labour-led government. The Educational Institute president, Linda Stewart, says the policies, if implemented, will make a huge difference to the sector. We're hoping to see some significant shifts around the funding levels of early childhood education. There's been a nine-year freeze on the subsidies there. We'd like to see that rectified and also return to 100% qualified teachers for every child. The plan would also see tertiary student allowances increase by $50 a week and zero fees for the first year. When it comes to immigration, Ms Ardern has said she will stick to cutting numbers by 20 to 30,000 people a year, something New Zealand First is certain to back. But Chair of the New Zealand Association for Migration and Investment, June Ranson, says Labor does not necessarily have an automatic mandate for an immigration crackdown because the Greens have a more open-door policy. Where they should be looking is in the student area and also in attracting the right skilled people here. 
But you have employers who are jumping up and down to fill the skill shortages they have, and they've got to have a lot of caution here because they're going to stifle economic growth in New Zealand. Labor also plans to stop overseas speculators buying existing houses and to introduce the Healthy Homes Guarantee Bill, which will require all rentals to be warm and dry. Tenants Protection Association manager Di Harwood says the action is long overdue. We're seeing the stuff that comes up every winter, which is <clears throat> the mould growth, the damp, the leaks. We're getting a lot of properties where there's been leaking, so water damage, and of course that leads to mould, then leads to a whole heap of health issues. One thing that has become clear today is farmers will not face water charges, something Labor floated during the campaign. Federated Farmers President Katie Milne says the decision is surprising, but farmers are still nervous at what taxes they could end up facing. There is a, probably going to be a little bit of nervousness amongst some of them, uh, but you know we want to work constructively with the new government and especially while our forming policy because there is a lot riding on this for rural New Zealand and it's where the, uh, the nervousness obviously will kick in. On the topic of water, Labor wants to hold a clean waters summit on cleaning up the country's rivers and lakes. It also wants to set a zero carbon emissions goal and set up an independent climate commission, something the Greens will no doubt back. One thing's for sure though, it's going to be a busy first 100 days. Mō te hōtaka o te ahihahi, ko Sally Murphy aho. Advocates for sexual abuse victims say the global social media campaign known as Me Too has given a voice to thousands of women who have previously suffered in silence. The Me Too campaign took off this week after dozens of women came forward with sexual harassment allegations against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein. Advocates say it's challenging the way society views sexual abuse. And now a New Zealand woman has created a web page for victims to anonymously share their experiences. The response has been heartbreaking and overwhelming. Jesse Chang reports. I went to his house to catch up. After talking for a bit, he said... A boy asked me if I knew what rape was. When I said no, he said... I was five when my mother's uncle started molesting me. In clubs in Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch... Story after story of harrowing experiences of sexual abuse have surfaced this week on Facebook and Twitter and now Tumblr. The creator of the Me Too New Zealand campaign, who RNZ has chosen not to name, says many victims are too scared to speak up publicly about their experiences. She says the page gives them a chance to add their voice and because it doesn't allow others to comment, it also eliminates the backlash and criticism that can come with social media. The Executive Director of Rape Prevention Education, Debbie Tohill, says while social media can be negative, the campaign has been a game changer. It can be very empowering for women to know that many other women have experienced what, what they've experienced. Um, and that they feel that they can openly talk about it. Ms Tohill says the campaign shows sexual abuse doesn't discriminate. It exists in all walks of life. Employment lawyer Barbara Bucket has represented clients who have suffered terrible sexual harassment in the workplace. I had a situation where uh, quite a big organisation, their social club was used for what they called having access to new recruits and the male members of the um, staff would have a scorecard and they would email each other with sort of de graphic details of what had happened. Ms Bucket says social media can be a platform for victims to speak out when they would otherwise be shut down. In the workplace these things are kept behind closed doors and confined to a one-to-one -one situational investigation. And invariably, uh, the person that would be making the complaint is usually censored. Actress Robin Malcolm is known for playing strong leads, including Westie Mum and matriarch Cheryl West in Outrageous Fortune. She says while the film industry in New Zealand doesn't have sexual harassment to Weinstein's extent, it still happens, and it's something that she's experienced. I remember my first... Um, my first job was a commercial and I remember the director saying so that I could hear it's wonderful that we, we cast her she's got such lovely big tits Ms Malcolm hopes the Harvey Weinstein saga and the Me Too campaign continues to change the way society treats sexual abuse The fact that what seems to have been one of the kings of this 
cretinous behaviour has toppled is seismic for the industry. And I hope um, as part of the ongoing conversation we have about women and sexual equality and women in the workplace and how we treat women. The New York Times broke the story on sexual harassment allegations against Harvey Weinstein two weeks ago. It has since led to the media mogul being sacked from his own company, ousted from the Academy Awards and condemned by Hollywood. For Checkpoint, call Jesse Chang TNA. <laughs> Former Prime Minister Helen Clark gives us her verdict on the new government. Assistant coach Wayne Smith signs up after more signs off after more than 20 years with the All Blacks, and an Air New Zealand passenger demands answers after a man was allowed to board a flight from Christchurch to Auckland using her identity. But first, here's Anna Thomas with the headlines. The Prime Minister in waiting, Labour leader Jacinda Ardern, says she expects to announce ministerial portfolios on Wednesday. Following this afternoon's caucus meeting, Ms Ardern revealed Labour's lineup of 16 cabinet ministers and five ministers outside cabinet. But their portfolios won't be revealed into a final sign-off with New Zealand First and the Green Party early next week. Ms Ardern told Checkpoint that allocating portfolios is a bit like the game of Jenga requiring a balance of experience, making use of new talent and taking coalition partners into account. She says she herself is interested in a role to do with child well-being. Ms Ardern says New Zealand First Leader Winston Peters has yet to decide whether he'll take up the offered role of a Deputy Prime Minister. The Association for Migration and Investment says the new government should be careful not to stifle economic growth when cutting immigration numbers. More than 72,000 people immigrated here in the year to July. The Prime Minister-designate Jacinda Ardern says Labour's policy is to reduce net immigration by 20 to 30,000 people a year. The Commerce Commission has told the High Court that social media do not threaten traditional media as much as news managers say. It says plenty of people still want to get their news from organisations that do proper research. The court case began when the Commerce Commission blocked a merger proposal that would have joined NZME and Fairfax, now rebranded as Stuff. If approved, the merger would create a vast media company comprising many daily and weekly newspapers and radio stations. Lucky Masterton motorists filling up at the Gull petrol station yesterday got a very good deal when the local franchisee accidentally dropped the regular 91 petrol price to 17 cents a litre, less than a tenth of the usual price. Spokesperson Rohan Mehta says it was meant to drop just 10 cents a litre ahead of Labour weekend, but the low, low price stayed in place for about 25 minutes. And that's the news. Kia ora, and a turning to business news now with Nona Peltier. Good afternoon, Nona. Sky City Entertainment had its annual meeting today. A big sh shareholder turnout, I uh, understand. The usual. It's always good because they give off nice vouchers for meals, parking <laughs> vouchers, bonus cards. It's all very, very nice, civilised. Huge group of people in the theatre today with their new and uh, their new chief executive, Graham Stevens, who you know actually did a really great job of uh, you know talking up the company's uh, fortunes and uh, sort of setting a new course. Really talking about the need for more partners, uh, re, you know, looking at non-core assets and thinking about what he does call it asset light. Uh, so what does that mean? I think he means he'll get rid of things that aren't exactly right to you know necessary, like the casino, for example. <laughs> So okay. Maybe something else. He uh, recently, the company bought the AA Centre at the corner of uh, Victoria and Albert Street in downtown Auckland, and it backs into Federal Street, which is one of their main um, plazas. So, talked a little bit about how he wants to see the City Link come in through there. He's uh, pretty good ideas, and talked about redeveloping Darwin or selling it perhaps. So over the next year, he's gonna come up with a plan before the next annual meeting to present to shareholders. So yeah, seemed like a bit of an action man. Oh, so big plans there. Now, what has the formation of the new government, what sort of impact has it had on the market? Actually quite a lot. Uh, not as volatile as you might think. You know, I guess it's because it, it's not a snap thing. People were kind of anticipating a change and so the market priced in a lot of what we saw. So, for example, um, our Kiwi dollar 
it uh, it had actually quite a large movement through the day. It started out around 70.36 US US cents, moved it as low as 69.73. So like, you know, we're talking eh, a reasonable drop, and that's below a, a level of 70 US cents, which is kind of a, it's an important measure. Once things drop below 70 cents, they kind of tend to stay there, and that's what we've seen through most of the day. Uh, last time I looked, it was 69.9, and it had been moving around quite a lot. The Australian dollar, it's at 18-month lows against the Australian. It dropped to 89.08, so we haven't seen that for a really long time. And exporters would be delighted with that, Absolutely wouldn't they? Absolutely delighted, yes. Uh, of course, because uh, the currency has fallen. Now, when we looked at the markets, the exporters were doing really well. Uh, this is when we're talking about the NZX Top 50 Index. Mm. Not so much for retirement village operators, though. Their prices fell, and that was partly because there's a a view that the housing market uh, will see prices fall and sales slow as the government reshapes policy there to make housing more affordable, at least in the Auckland market. And that may slow down the sales of retirement villages because p older folks selling their properties and then moving into retirement villages, it might take a little longer. But mm -hmm. inevitably, it will happen. So it just may take a little longer. So the share prices reflected that. But nevertheless, we've been seeing a kind of an interesting trend. So in the morning, the market's quite low, and we saw that. The, 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 at one stage, the top 50 index was down nearly 100 points, which is quite a lot yeah. in a day. But it finished up at another record close, now just wow. barely five points up to 8,130. That's its 13th consecutive record close, and we've seen that in Asia as well. And uh, with the Asian markets booming, um, we're seeing that flowing through into the New Zealand market. We're seeing that in Wall Street as well. And it's really interesting that today is the 30th anniversary of the 1987 share market crash. So how did it end up? Uh, we ended up at 8,130 points, another record close for us. Wow, thank you very much, Nona Peltier. Well, former Prime Minister Helen Clark says despite being Labour's leader for less than three months, Prime Minister-elect Jacinda Ardern has proven she has a backbone of steel. Ms Clark told me via Skype from London she was proud of Ms Ardern's success and her strength during the negotiations, but had yet to talk to her. Not spoken, but we have communicated by WhatsApp several times. <laughs> and, and what have you said to her? Well, obviously, congratulations, a phenomenal job done in those uh, negotiations to get to the point uh, where Jacinda is on the brink of being sworn in as Prime Minister. I think you've described it as extraordinary what has happened um, since the election or since before the election when be she became the Labour leader in that short period of time. How has she been able to do it, to ascend from deputy leader position in opposition to prime minister in the space of three months? Well, she really stepped up to that challenge. She was throwing a, a pretty curved ball uh, back when Andrew Little stood down and she was unanimously selected as leader and it looked like mission impossible. And I guess at the time she thought, well, you know, I can save the party from a crushing defeat, but how far can I take it? But actually, she took it uh, all the way to uh, quite a credible result. It has to be remembered, when I first formed a, a government, you know, we, we weren't uh, too far away from the support that Jacinda has drawn in, I think uh, somewhere around the 38% the mark. Uh, so that was incredible in just a few weeks. And then uh, to go on and negotiate quite a complex uh, agreement uh, with the three parties, I think, shows considerable negotiating skills. So from what I've seen uh, through the campaign and then the way that they have doggedly stuck at these negotiations, I think she's got the, the making of a good term of government in her. You're speaking to people all over the world about this. Um, it, you've been speaking about it in the last few hours. What words are you using to describe Ms Ardern? I think that Jacinda is characterised by enormous empathy. She exudes empathy and she's a very, very good communicator. So people very much feel, and I think the, the perception is the reality, that Jacinda is interested in them. She's interested in their family. She's interested in, in how they are doing. She wants to make a difference for people. She's very motivated by that. And I think people warm to her because she is warm as a personality and can communicate that warmth.
Is that enough, though, to be the leader of a country, to have that empathy? Do, she needs much more than that, doesn't she? She's, she needs to be... Well, I, I think she's shown, shown she's also got backbone and some steel. Uh, she did quite well in, in some pretty tough debates that she was, you know, thrown into with reasonably short notice as a as a new leader. So, look, empathy is an incredibly important thing. The ability to communicate is incredibly important, but also to have have backbone, to be firm when you have to be firm. Consult, include, but be firm. Political scientists are talking about this as a story for the political textbooks. Do you, would you agree with that? Well, I think it's not only New Zealand that's breaking the mould. We've just in the last few days seen a 31-year-old uh, in a position to become the Prime Minister of Austria. We saw Emmanuel Macron at 39 become the President of France. Who would ever have thought that that, that would be possible and as an independent candidate? So we're, we're in a new age. I don't think this could have been done in my time as politics, but I think people are much more open now to young people coming forward and doing their best. And do you think her youth is the most fascinating aspect of this? I mean, what about, you know, the, the negotiations that have gone on, the, the fact that it's not the, the party that got the most votes that is now in power? I think it is her youth that has really got the international media sitting up and talking. Uh, the fact that she's not only young but is also a young woman adds another element to it because we don't have too many young women leaders around uh, the world at all. Uh, in terms of the, you know, the biggest party or not, uh, in New Zealand, that's the way it's gone over the first 20 years of, of MMP, but it's not the way these systems work everywhere. The Norwegian Labour Party, for example, has generally been the, the biggest party, but not always formed the government. So it's just the way these proportional systems work. You, you can have close to half the votes, but if you can't form the alliances that are going to take you over the line, uh, then you're going to end up with, this, with the silver medal, not the gold one. A lot of people since polling day have been talking about, you know, a lot of voters saying they've been talking about this, this election in terms of winners and losers based on who got more seats. Even Australia media reporting that the losers are actually in power now. Does, do you think that the New Zealand voter actually understands the concept of proportional representation and that they're going to accept this? Well, actually, I think they do. I listen to a lot of conversations about how people say they're going to vote. And some people quite consciously vote for a coalition partner. I might say, as a party leader, I found that a bit depressing. I used to say, well, look, we'll look after that in the negotiations after the election. But there is certainly a body of voters that want to pick the coalition partner for you. And it's also true that in this election, uh, Labour went in with an agreement with the Greens, just as way back in 1999, I went in with an agreement with Jim Anderton and Sandra Lee. So when people voted for you, they knew what the package uh, was going to be. Have you spoken to Winston Peters? No, I haven't, but I, I will be sending him him a text. Look, you know, for the record, I worked with Winston Peters very closely for three years. And I have to say, when he gave his word on the formation of the government, that word was never broken. And uh, it was a, a harmonious working relationship. And that's the former Prime Minister, Halle Clark. Well, the parties that make up the new Labour-led government have 18 Māori MPs. Labour's deputy leader, Calvin Davis, describes that representation as massive, saying that he knows now that there have been some wins for Māori. More than 60% of voters in the Māori electorates gave Labour their party vote, with the mood for change more apparent than in the general seats. Labour also made a clean sweep of the seven Māori seats, booting the Māori party out of Parliament. So what kind of changes do Māori want? Te Manu Kōrehi reporter Shannon Honui-Thompson has more. The pressure is on for all Māori MPs in the new government to deliver changes that were promised during their election campaign. One New Zealand First policy looks to already be off the table. Winston Peters says his party didn't get enough support to hold a referendum on the Māori seats, which means they're staying for at least the next three years. 
Māori communications consultant Scott Campbell says having such a strong Māori caucus within the Labour government will be positive for Te Ao Māori. The, the national government obviously was pushing three treaty settlements uh, over the last three years in particular. Uh, some of those treaty settlements will need to be probably looked at by the Labour government. Uh, and and how Labour deals with treaty settlements going forward will be really interesting to see. The treaty settlement for the biggest iwi in the country, Ngāpuhi, has been stalled for years, and Nationals' pullback from the negotiations left the two opposing groups, to Horonuku and Te Kotahitanga, to decide who would represent the iwi. Scott Campbell says all unresolved settlements will be revisited by the new incoming government, and iwi should expect huge changes. There's a lot of contention and, and controversy around those settlements. You know, you only have to look at uh, Tauranga and Hauraki settlement. There were uh, complaints or allegations that they were being rushed through by the minister. The Ngāpuhi settlement, well, there's a huge opportunity there now, and hopefully that settlement comes back to the table, but I, I suspect there'll be huge changes uh, with how that settlement is set up at the moment. Senior Māori National Party member and Ngāpuhi kaumatua Ri Haridāguil says he's not sad Winston went with Labour and believes before looking at settlements, the government needs to look at the social deprivation in Māori communities. I think Nationals learned a lesson that, uh, you know, to pursue policies that really go against the grain or the will of the people out there is not at all acceptable, neither is it sustainable. Though I must say, they've managed the economy very well. But the deprivation of our people is their fault. The socio-economic situation, the housing situation, they cannot walk away from that nine years and they never did nothing about it. Former Labour Party MP John Tamihere wants the new government to close their growing inequality gap. The chief executive of Te Whanau Waipareta Trust in West Auckland, which supports urban Māori and provides health, youth and social services, says Māori and cities have struggled over the past nine years. The gulf between the winners and the losers grew quite starkly to the extent of a homeless situation exploded in the last nine years. Our incarceration rate kept going north. Māori unemployment today is 11%, general population 4.5. John Tamihere says Winston Peters made his choice on people wanting change, but says that's not going to happen overnight. You can't change six generations of deprivation overnight. Everything from the way in which education is uh, handled and meted out, access, equality, equity, these sorts of issues which are about capitalism applied with responsibility and that's the human face of it. Mr Tamihere says regardless of how many Māori MPs there are in government, it will only be meaningful if Māori MPs are given high positions where they can make significant policy changes. Mo te hōtaka o te ahiahi nei ko Shannon Honui Thompson. Aho. Air New Zealand is investigating how a man was able to board a plane yesterday using another passenger's boarding pass. Alexis was flying from Christchurch to Auckland yesterday and says she was confused to find when she arrived at the gate that a man with a boarding pass in her name was not only sitting in her seat but had also added a bag to her itinerary. I checked in yesterday because I was travelling from Auckland to Christchurch um, and both my boarding passes printed. And then when I was flying home from Crouches yesterday afternoon, um, I went to check in and it said I was already checked in and I just assumed that that was because I had my boarding pass from when I checked in to go to Christchurch, so I had both of them. Um, and then I'd gone through security and I was in the bathroom and I got an email from Air New Zealand, but I didn't think anything of it and I didn't open it. Um, and then I tried to check in and the person at the scanner said that somebody else had already checked in with my boarding pass and I was like, What? So then they what? made me go and see the ground staff. So was this at the gate when you tried yes. to get on onto the plane? Yes, so at the gate they scanned my ticket and they said that somebody else had already boarded with that boarding pass and then I just had to see the peop- the ground staff at the desk next to the check-in. Um, and then that's where the lady said that, yeah, somebody else had already checked in with my boarding pass and then mm-hmm. just asked if I had ID and I provided them with my ID and they're like, OK, so this is definitely you. Mm. Um, and then I was like, yeah. And they said, oh, OK, so you've added a bag on today. And I said, no, I haven't added a bag on. They're like, oh, there's a charge here for a bag being added on at $60. And I was like, oh, well, no, that's not me. 
Um, and then she was like, oh, that's that's really weird. So then I checked my emails and I actually had a receipt for a bag, which wasn't me. This was the other person had added a bag, like, against my name. And then one of the flight attendants went down and checked who was in my seat and came back up with the boarding pass that the person had used to get on the plane. And it was my exact, like, boarding pass with my name on it. Um, so they went back down and took the man from the plane and then he was standing at the front desk and then he started to say that I'd stolen his identity. So you were, you were at the desk at the time as well? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he was on the phone and he was speaking in like a different language and then they started looking for his bag and this went on for like half an hour sort of thing. So the flight was delayed. Um, and then I don't really know what happened but we both got taken back onto the flight and his bag that he'd checked in with my name tag on it was obviously still on the flight and he was led onto the flight so I don't really know what happened and I just want some answers. So he accused you of stealing his identity? Yes, yeah. And how did yeah. how did Air New Zealand handle it? They, I don't think they heard him say that. Like, because the lady was on the phone to the people trying to find the bag and he sort of just said it and I was like, whoa, what? And then... I was just like, okay. And then she was like, you can just sit down. So I just ended up sitting on the seats near the desk. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so random. Have you spoken to Air New Zealand since? Yeah, so I called them. The man on the plane like advised me that they were going to do a section report. Um, and then he also said that I should ring Air New Zealand just to check that my other flights that were in my account hadn't been compromised. So I called them yesterday and they just pulled my flights out of the account um, and it blocked me from being able to check in. I have to go up to the desk now to provide ID. But then I was talking to my parents about it when I got home yesterday after I'd called in New Zealand. And I was like, actually, you know, I want to, like, find out other stuff. Like, how did he actually manage to get on the flight? How did he manage to book a bag without, like, ID and stuff? So I rung them um, and I said, like, hey, this is what's happened. And then I was on hold for 15 minutes. So I hung up because I was like, that's not good enough. And I called back and spoke to someone else and they just, they would sort of downplayed and sh shrugged it off like it was nothing and gave me an email address. And that's it? Yeah. So you, you have to email somebody? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Are you surprised that the other guy got on the flight, the one who had your ticket? Yeah. That's what I mean. Like, I don't know. He was, like, aggressive towards me sort of thing. I don't know how, like, he got on without... If he was trying to get on as me, did he have a ticket? That went, like, how did he end up getting on the... Like, were the police called? Because he tried to be, like, pretend to be me. And we've just received a statement from Air New Zealand. It says Alexis was a victim of human error. It says the first three letters of Alexis's surname and the male passengers were the same and a staff member gave the man the wrong boarding pass for his ticket. Air New Zealand says it's a rare mistake and the staff member has since on, undergone refresher training. Well, New Zealand, uh, top New Zealand hospice and palliative care doctors say patients don't have access to stronger pain-killing drugs because they aren't fully funded. Many pain-killing drugs are subsidised by Pharmac and open-listed. That means anyone can theoretically access them. But due to inequalities between hospitals and hospices, some patients aren't getting the relief they need. Alex Perite reports. Pharmac says many painkilling drugs are available, but the man who co-wrote Pharmac's palliative care handbook, Dr Rod McLeod, says at Hibiscus Hospice in Auckland, he can't get hold of a rapid onset, short-acting, strong painkiller. If you're having incident pain or what's called breakthrough pain, it's sudden acute severe pain, you want something that works within minutes, not within 15 or 20 minutes. Dr Brian Ensor is the Director of Palliative Care at Mary Potter Hospice in Wellington. He says there's historical reasons for the lack of funding for hospices as they started as community initiatives. His hospice needs to raise $6 million every year and says the building itself is long overdue for renovation. He feels drug supply is at times in the same condition. The care of the dying feels like a somewhat forgotten little subset of medicine with our hands waving in the air saying, uh, us too please. Because there is some really good and exciting stuff out there in medicine that we need to scavenge and bring into the care of the dying. Dr Brian Ensor mentions Propofol, Penthrox, Entonox or laughing gas and other hospital drugs that he can't get hold of due to cost. 
In a statement, the Pharmac Director of Operations, Sarah Fitt, says some of the more powerful drugs can only be used in hospitals due to the level of additional care and monitoring required to use them safely. Dr Rachel Wiseman is a palliative medicine specialist who works in a hospital. But she agrees hospices are the poorer cousin as they have a different funding mechanism to hospitals and a different budget. She says that needs to be fixed. There should not be the inequity of access that um, we have. And I hope at some point in the near future that the Ministry of Health uh, looks at that um, because I think it does cause a significant problem. There are drugs that I cannot start in hospital because I know the patient will not be able to access them once they leave. Dr Rachel Wiseman says another cause is that people dying from cancer are living longer, which could be seen as a positive thing, but drugs used to manage their symptoms have not grown at the same pace. She says that problem isn't restricted to New Zealand. Patients are now living long enough that we are running out of options, which is making life incredibly difficult for us. The doctors say Australia has better access to strong painkillers that patients need here. Sarah Fitt says Pharmac expects to receive an application soon regarding new drugs that are used in Australia and it will seek expert advice around access and funding. Mota hotaka o te ahi ahi, ko Alex Perite aho. And you can hear more about palliative care and the euthanasia debate on Insight just after the 8 o'clock news on Sunday morning. It's been an afternoon of high emotion, oratory, anger, laughter and tears on the last day of the massive Waitangi Tribunal inquiry into the grievances of Northern Māori. After nine years of work and 31 weeks of hearings, claimants can rest at last. And the Tribunal must now produce its report on the grievances of Ngāpui and other iwi in the north. Lois Williams filed this report from Waitangi. It's been the biggest inquiry ever undertaken by the Waitangi Tribunal into the history of the biggest iwi in Aotearoa. In the words of Judge Coxhead, 400 claims, 15,600 documents, 8,740 briefs of evidence, and it's been life-changing. Uh, the first time that I came to the North was for a judicial conference for these hearings, and that was on the 26th of September 2008. Uh, at that time I had an afro. <laughs> I was a lot younger, <laughs> and they, I always remember, because at the poor hitty, they told me, uh, they said, boy, <laughs> go back to Wellington and get a man to come back and do this job. More than 200 claimants gathered at Waitangi this afternoon to mark the end of the hearings and farewell the tribunal. Many loved and respected elders have died in the course of the seven years, including the tribunal member Dr Ranginui Walker and the Ngāti Hini leader Irima Henare and the far north elder Rima Edwards. They too were all remembered and farewelled. Nā waira te tangi te hoki a ngā mai Nā te iwi, ngā uri, o rātou ki te pōhi. Akahuri. Over the past seven years, the Crown Council Andrew Irvine has been there, facing the painful testimony of the past with a calm demeanour and sometimes forced to defend the indefensible. His frequent use of te reo as a Pākehā lawyer has impressed many, and he told the people today the experience had been cathartic, not just for the claimants. He cathartic mā koutou anake, engari mā te tarei piunara hoki me tēnei roi a te karauna i etahi wā. There is frustration still that the Crown has, in the eyes of Ngāpuhi, avoided a satisfactory explanation of how it came to acquire sovereignty when the Tribunal has found the Chiefs never handed it over. But this afternoon was more about acknowledging the end of a tough journey and the friendships and respect that have flourished along the way. Here's Tribunal member Dr Anne Parsonson. I don't think I knew until I came here what staunch really means. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's a staunch that's come through uh, 170 years uh, of your often so painful history. 
And this is Dr Robin Anderson, who complained that Ngāpuhi hospitality over the years had caused a significant expansion of her waistline. Just generally thank you for the thoughtfulness of, of your responses. So, kia ora, and um, I'm going to miss coming up here. So, thank you. <laughs> the barrister Tavaki Baron Afiaki spoke for the small army of lawyers who worked for the claimants over the long years of the Paparahi Otaraki inquiry. And he reminded the audience that the footprints of the North lead forward as well as backwards. The Pākehā custom of toasting absent friends, he said, should include friends that the iwi have yet to meet. So I do mihi to those who passed, I do mihi to those who couldn't come today, but I mihi in hope for our future, of our friendship, our alliances, our co-warriors who walk the path we must walk, to create and reinvent and recreate our destinies. On the last day of the Ngāpuhi hearings and the first of a new government, the hapū now turn their sights towards the tribunal's report and eventually a settlement. E Waitangi, ko Lois Williams tēnei. RNZ News at 6 o'clock. Good evening, I'm Anna Thomas. The presumptive Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern will take the weekend to finalise specific ministerial portfolios with New Zealand First. There are no surprises in the 16-member Labour Cabinet, which includes the current lineup of senior MPs. Ms Ardern says her team has experience, expertise and drive, but she admits she's not happy with the gender balance of only six women ministers. We set ourselves a goal as a Labour Party that we would bring more women into our caucus. When we set that goal, we set it at 50%. Uh, uh, we'll continue to make sure that we try and see that reflected in our membership as they come up through roles and responsibilities. Jacinda Ardern suggested she may create some new portfolios such as forestry and split other roles such as transport. Ms Ardern will likely have a role in the area of arts as well as the children's portfolio. The Primary Teachers Union says if implemented, Labour's education policies will make a huge difference to the sector. Charter schools and the national standards are likely to be early casualties of the new Labour-led government. Labour also wants to increase tertiary student allowances by $50 a week and introduce zero fees for the first year. The NZDI president, Linda Stewart, says the majority of teachers will be relieved to see national standards go. We're hoping to see some significant shifts around the funding levels of early childhood education. There's been a nine-year freeze on the subsidies there. We'd like to see that rectified and also return to 100% qualified teachers for every child. Linda Stewart from the NZEI. The Association for Migration and Investment is warning the new government to tread carefully when cutting immigration numbers as it could stifle economic growth. More than 72,000 people immigrated here in the year to July, Statistic New Zealand figures show. And Jacinda Ardern says she will stick with Labour's policy to reduce net immigration by 20 to 30,000 people a year. The association's chair, June Ranson, says they don't have the mandate for an immigration crackdown because the Greens have more of an open-door policy. You have employers who are jumping up and down to fill the skill shortages they have and they've got to have a lot of caution here because they're going to stifle economic growth in New Zealand. June Ranson from the Association for Migration and Investment. The Queenstown Lakes District Council is considering cracking down on the private home rental company Airbnb. A task force on housing affordability has blamed the service for taking close to 3,000 homes and flats out of the long-term rental market. It says houses in Queenstown are the least affordable in the country and leaving it up to the market to solve the problem is no longer an option. The Mayor, Jim Bolt, says while he does not want to run Airbnb out of the town completely, there are steps it could take to make it less lucrative. Council can restrict the amount of time properties are made available on Airbnb by placing a significant rating surcharge on the properties that are rented out in that manner. You know, we can make it reasonably unattractive. Jim Bolt says while Airbnb helps to house visitors to the town, that Queenstown also needs to accommodate the locals that help to keep it functioning.
Warm, dry and windy conditions are fanning a large fire near Tiano in Southland. Firefighters were alerted to the uncontrolled burn-off on the side of Mount Prospect just after 2 o'clock this afternoon and still working to contain it. A fire and emergency spokeswoman says the fire has now ripped through 1,000 hectares and six helicopters are being used to fight the fire as the terrain is difficult. She says while the fire is a significant size, it is not threatening any buildings. She says firefighters are hopeful cool and wet weather expected tomorrow will ease the blaze. A person has died in a car crash on State Highway 2 near Wairoa. The police say the car crashed about half past three near Raupanga and the driver, the only person in the car, died at the scene. The serious crash unit will investigate. It's four minutes past six. Workers have marked the shutdown of the Holden production line in Adelaide forever by crowding together to form the word Holden outside the factory. It marks the end of 69 years of Australian-made car manufacturing. Enthusiasts lined up outside in the cars to say farewell, including Shailene Quist in her Tirana. Managed to support the Holden workers and the families and um, just proud that you know Elizabeth has got something like this and it's very sad that it's be closing today. Shailene Quest. The Holden plant at Elizabeth opened in 1963 and at its peak between June 2003 and July 2005 produced 780 vehicles a day. To sport and the All Blacks flanker Matt Todd has been ruled out of Saturday night's third and final Bledisloe Cup test in Brisbane with injury. Todd was due to start on the bench tomorrow but suffered a groin injury in training. Adi Savia will replace Todd in the match day 23. Meanwhile, the Wallabies have had their captains run this afternoon at Brisbane Suncorp Stadium ahead of tomorrow night's test. Coach Michael Checker says the All Blacks have been in ruthlessly good form this season and they'll be tough to beat. They've had an outstanding championship. They're going to be coming here to try and repeat, I'd imagine, the first half of Game 1. And we're going to have to play so much better than we've been playing to get up there and challenge them. Michael Checker. Meanwhile, one of the finalists for Domestic Rugby's championship title will be decided tonight as top-ranked Wellington host underdogs Northland at Westpac Stadium at 7.30. New Zealander Stephen Adams' Oklahoma Thunder have opened their NBA season with a 105-84 win against the New York Knicks. Adams made 12 points, 5 rebounds and 5 steals. New Zealand Rugby has announced a deal with Sky to live stream the All Blacks November matches against the UK Barbarians and a France 15 as pay-per-view events. It'll cost fans 25 bucks to watch each game live streamed on allblackstv.com. And English snooker player Ronnie O'Sullivan let a spectator who evaded security and ran around the table take his last shot after he won in the third round at the English Open at the Crucible in Sheffield. O'Sullivan calmly potted the pink to win the game, then handed his cue to the spectator who missed two attempts to pot the black before being led away. And that's the news. On Saturday morning, marking the 40th anniversary of Nevermind the Bollocks with Sex Pistol Glenn Matlock and Maxine Gay on her 30 years on the front line fighting for workers' rights. Sheila Magadza, once the tea lady of the New Zealand Festival, now the artistic director with next year's lineup. And Big Daddy Wilson and his band drop by the studio to play the blues. Join me, Richard Langston, tomorrow from 8am on RNZ National. And now the short forecast from Met Service to midnight tomorrow. Northland and Auckland, mostly cloudy with a few light showers. Western areas from Waikato to Wellington, also Coromandel, Bay of Plenty and the central high country. Mostly fine, but isolated showers about Waikato and Bay of Plenty. Cloudier tomorrow with light showers in the west and a spell of rain in the evening. Uh, yes. On to Gisborne and Hawke's Bay now and a few showers north of Napier, but fine tomorrow. Wired up at Marlborough and Nelson, fine, but a few afternoon or evening showers tomorrow, especially in the west. Buller and Westland, mostly cloudy. Rain developing tomorrow morning, then easing to showers in the afternoon. Canterbury and Otago, fine, but showers developing tomorrow morning, but they will clear later. 
Southland and Fiordland rain tonight and tomorrow morning it will clear, but scattered rain will return late tomorrow night. And for the Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. RNZ National, it is eight minutes past six and you're listening to Checkpoint with Sharon Brett Kelly. Kia ora, Anna. Well, Prime Minister-designate Jacinda Ardern has revealed who Labour has elected to be ministers in the next government she's forming with New Zealand First. But she says she's not happy with the gender balance, with just seven women out of 21, and is vowing to bring more up to the top level. Political reporter Benedict Collins has more on how the country's 52nd government looks to be shaping up. It was all cheers as the Prime Minister-elect Jacinda Ardern kicked off her first caucus meeting since it became clear she would lead the next government. Look, obviously the result for us was um, somewhat delayed. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but it's an MEP environment and uh, going into that, of course, we campaigned incredibly hard on all of the issues that matter so deeply to us in the communities that we represent. I thank you for the work you did in the campaign. I thank you for the support you've given us. Um, and now let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> On her way into the caucus meeting, Labour's Carmel Cipollone was hopeful. I'd love to be a minister, um, and um, all of us would, and um, you know that's what we're here for. So go in there today and we'll see what happens. Phil Twyford going to be the housing minister. Um, well, we serve at the pleasure of the leader and the caucus, so uh, I'll do whatever is asked of me. OK, so if yeah. you don't get made a minister, you'll be happy? I'd be disappointed. OK, yeah. so you're expecting a ministerial portfolio? I would like to serve in the ministry, but yeah, that's as far as it goes. So, you know, it's one election after another around here. Both Ms Cipollone and Phil Twyford, who's been tipped for a housing portfolio, were successful. But the public won't know for certain until next Wednesday which portfolios the Labour ministers will hold. The exception is Grant Robertson, who will be Finance Minister, while Jacinda Ardern says she's still interested in the Arts and Culture portfolio and wants to keep involved in children's issues. David Clark is likely to get the health portfolio and Deputy Leader Calvin Davis corrections. But just six of Labour's 16 Cabinet Ministers are women and just one of its five Ministers outside of Cabinet. Ms Ardern acknowledges that's not good enough. I'm going to make sure that we continue to work on bringing through more of our team. Uh, we set ourselves a goal uh, as a Labour Party that we would bring uh, more women into our caucus. When we set that goal, we set it at uh, 50% and we came very close to achieving that this election. I'm proud of that. Uh, we'll continue to make sure that we try and see that reflected in uh, our membership as they come up through roles and responsibilities uh, through uh, both our caucus uh, and through our cabinet. New Zealand First will have four cabinet ministers in the new government and Winston Peters is weighing up whether he wants to be Deputy Prime Minister or take on other roles. The Greens will have three ministers outside of Cabinet, and today they revealed a range of policy gains they made in negotiations with Labour. Under the new government, drug use will be treated as a health issue, and the public will vote, in what's been coined the referendum, on whether to legalise marijuana for personal use. Greens leader James Shaw says it's time for the public to have its say. After Helen Kelly's medicinal cannabis campaign and other moves to move towards a more regulated market model in places like um, Colorado and Hawaii and, and some of the states in Canada and so on, um, that it does seem that the public uh, mood has shifted on that. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, maybe it's time to put that to the test. The new government will also try to eliminate the gender pay gap in the public service, with Mr Shaw noting that some government departments pay men up to 20% more than women for performing the same roles. From Parliament for Checkpoint, Benedict Collins. So now the waiting game is finally over and we know who is forming the next government. What next? Out on the streets of New Zealand, are people hoping for big policy changes or a steady hand at the tiller? Hope and change or strong and stable? We sent RNZ reporters out around the country to find out what voters thought the new government's policy priorities should be. Here's Charlie Drever. In downtown Auckland, social justice is high on the agenda. Well, I'm would hope to see is that the the new government's got a bit more of a focus on the inequality in society. For Aucklanders, you know, I just hope that some of our homelessness is dealt with more equality within our society. And, and I just hope that we kind of review the way that we look at capitalism and our financial system, that it feeds everyone, not just the 
people with the wherewithal to work that system. I'd like to see people being able to access homes and I like the new policy about just slowing down on immigration so that we focus more on people who are ready in New Zealand, make sure that, that their well-being are looked after first. In the Wellington suburb of Newtown, the environment, housing and immigration are all hot-button issues. I got what I wanted, that was the rivers, that was the uh, not selling our water to the, to the Chinese and immigration. I didn't care who gave me those three things, but I got, I got what I wanted. I'm hoping that her policy on the housing market is going to work because there's a lot of like empty spaces where they've pulled down housing New Zealand houses and they're not doing anything with it. I don't like a few of her policies, so I feel like cutting the immigration might not do too well for us. In Porirua, the high cost of housing is the main issue on residents' lips. Alex Gillespie says between that and low wages, he's feeling the pinch. Um, well, I don't even have any kids or anything, and I'm still struggling to pay my, my bills. And I've been looking for a place around here for like over a year now, and I still can't find anything in my price range. In Christchurch, there's a clear focus on health and the environment. New Zealand and Christchurch in particular is um, not in a place that it should be with young people and mental health issues. Um, so that's what I was mainly looking at. So I'd be interested to see whether they'll be putting any focus into um, bettering people's wellbeing and their living situations. I'm really opposed to free education because I think they're going to take the money off health. I like the idea of perhaps the Greens having an influence on, uh, on rivers and uh, environment generally. I'd like to see education funding for education increased. I think we've got a long way to go with the homelessness issue that we have here, but there's also a lot going on in the regions that needs a bit of attention too. When I see my environment, I feel that everybody is living for themselves and nobody cares about uh, their neighbours or friends and family. Agreements with both NZ First and the Greens are expected to be released early next week. For Checkpoint, I'm Charlie Drever. A Dunedin musician has been cleared of wrongdoing after his latest album caused police to shut down much of central Dunedin earlier this year. 44-year-old Dean Barnes, who goes by the moniker LSD Fundraiser, appeared in the Dunedin District Court today facing a charge of threatening a building related to June, June's bomb scare. Timothy Brown was in court. Businesses were evacuated and central Dunedin streets cordoned off on June 16th after the discovery of what police described at the time as a suspicious package. The small tinfoil wrapped package was accompanied by a note which read, I will firebomb your car, I will hack into your computer, I will leak trade and state secrets. It turned out the note was the work of Mr Barnes and was intended to be an artistic expression of the plight of homelessness. The tinfoil wrapped package was his latest album, Street Noise, and it was intended as a gift to its finder. However, the incident resulted in him facing the unusual charge of threatening a building. The atypical nature of the case and the concession from police prosecutor Sergeant Adrian Chain that Mr Barnes had not intended the poem to be a threat prompted Judge John MacDonald, midway through the evidence, to question how police would run their case. Is this a threat to the owner of the building or a threat to the world at large, Sergeant? Well, as the charge is laid, sir, it's a threat to, the, to that particular building. No point making a threat to a building, is there? After questioning the police case, Judge John MacDonald said he was ready to allow the evidence to continue. Sorry, I, I, I was troubled, so I've got it off my chest. I feel better, I suppose. <laughs> right, thank you. Pleased about that. However, the difficulty of the police case continued when it came to deciding what the alleged threat actually said. The first two lines, it says, nothing else if to lose, I will firebomb your house and barn. That's what it says? Uh, no. It says, I will firebomb your house and your car. Sergeant Chain then questioned the defendant on how he would interpret his work. If I was just to pass you a note saying that I'll firebomb your house and car, how would you take that to get to you? Personally, I wouldn't take it as a threat because I have neither a car or a house. After it was accepted the police could not establish Mr Barnes intended the work to be a threat, Judge John MacDonald promptly threw out the case without requiring an adjournment, eliciting applause from the public gallery. But I'm dismissing the charge now. Outside court, Mr Barnes said he was pleased the matter was now behind him. Uh, I don't know if an apology is necessary, but um, 
like I said, I think it was a, a huge overreaction on their part. In Dunedin for Checkpoint, Timothy Brown. The Commerce Commission has told the High Court that traditional media is not as threatened by new media as news managers say. And there's still a need and a demand for unbiased research journalism produced by mainstream media. The comments were made on a day of five, uh, day five of a legal battle over a large-scale merger between NZME and Fairfax, now rebranded as Stuff. If approved, the merger would create a vast media company comprising the New Zealand Herald, Dominion Post, Stuff website, News Talk ZB and many other radio stations and provisional, prov provincial and weekly newspapers. Eric Frickberg reports. The Commerce Commission blocked the proposed merger in May, saying it would create an unprecedented concentration of newspapers in New Zealand at a cost to democracy and to the public. But the media companies appealed, and counsel for NZME earlier argued in the High Court that the merger was needed because of competition from new media, such as what's produced on Facebook and in blogs. This undermined its advertising revenue and readership, and urgent steps were needed. The two companies had to unite to survive. But an opening counter-submission to the court, Counsel for the Commerce Commission, Jim Farmer QC, challenged this view. Competition from social media and blogs, he said, wasn't real competition at all. To think of a blog as news is an enormous insult to professional journalists who work hard in providing responsible and serious news in an age where we now have something called fake news and all the other noise that the internet produces. Mr Farmer argued researched and balanced journalism was essential for society as a whole and people of all ages wanted to get their stories from established media. The news media play a vital role as a conduit of reliable information about what is happening in the world and as a means of holding power to account. The public continues to rely on mainstream media sources for their news. But Mr Farmer said there needed to be competition in the media for its vital social function to work properly. If the proposed merger went ahead, the combined company would control 90% of New Zealand's newspaper market and over half its radio market. In their present state, the two chains produced as many news stories as the next three largest news organisations combined. Mr Farmer argued the number of stories produced by NZME and Stuff would likely reduce if they merged, especially on their online platform. Earlier NZME cited RNZ and TVNZ as evidence that there would still be many voices in the media even if the merger went ahead. And they said only 13% of the population get their news from traditional newspapers. Mr Farmer will continue pressing his case on Tuesday and the hearing should be wrapped up at the end of next week. Justice Robert Dobson is expected to reserve his decision. For Checkpoint, Eric Frickberg. Tomorrow night's Bledisloe Cup test in Brisbane marks the end of an era for the All Blacks as assistant coach Wayne Smith is involved with the team for the final time. It brings to a close an association of more than 20 years. Smith played 17 tests for New Zealand between 90 and 1985, but it is his contribution as a coach that he will be best remembered for. The man known as The Professor, thanks to his intelligence and tactical brilliance, has had three coaching stints with the All Blacks, one in charge and two as an assistant, and was part of both the 2011 and 2015 World Cup triumphs. On the eve of his final All Blacks test, Smith spoke to sports reporter Clay Wilson about how he was feeling about the end and what his future holds. I miss the people, um, definitely. You know, the, the contest been you know have been great I, I love that I'm competitive but you know the trophies and and the titles and that they, they all tarnish over time but the relationships don't and and that's that's what I've loved about it I've got you know the, the staff for example that there's no one on the staff or players that couldn't come and start my place and I'd be annoyed if they passed through Cambridge without coming to see me you know that that's the way it is and and that's what I love about it but all those um, really strong connections Having said all that, how much are you looking forward to having that extra time for the, I guess, for the other things in your life that are important to you and the other things that, you know, you're passionate, yep. passionate about? Yep. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm ready for that. Um, you know, I've got a grandson in Auckland, so um, Trish and I want to spend a bit more time with them. Um, I've got uh, friends overseas in Italy, for example, who are like family, so um, 
I'll probably go and do a, a few little projects over there. I'm going to do enough um, sort of rugby-based stuff to to keep me involved in the game and uh, give me what I, you know what I need from the game in terms of um, a bit of coaching and and connecting with people. Might play a bit of golf. I, you know, I've played golf, for example, for years really, and and just little things like that. Maybe a bit of fishing, get away in the motorhome. The stuff that you know you put on hold because. The All Blacks are so all-encompassing, you know, it, it dominates your life. Will it also feel, do you expect that it'll feel slightly odd in a way, a bit, a bit strange? Yeah, I think watching the games will be odd um, because, you know, for a third of my life, I've, I've been involved in them and um, either as a player or a coach, um, there's, a, there's a bit of, you know, nervousness during the week, there's a little bit of anxiety, there's a um, large amount of work to be done and, and then there's, during the game, you don't really watch the game. You're, I'm reviewing clips all the time. I'm looking at what we can improve and what we're doing well and what I'm going to say at half time and all those sorts of things. So I think, um, yeah, watching the games with family or friends on TV is going to be slightly different. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> just, just reflecting a bit now on your, your sort of career with the All Blacks, it's renowned as such a special club to be a part of after being part of that club for, for so long, does it become normal in any way or is it still just as special as the as the first day you you joined it? Yeah, it's, it's just as special as ever and we do a lot of work on that. Um, I think it's one of the things about the All Blacks is that you never lose that uniqueness. You're, you're very aware that you don't choose the All Blacks, they choose you and that there are certain accountabilities attached to that and, and standards and um, performance, you know. And so you, 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 you can never take anything for granted when you're in this team. You've, you've got to constantly perform and, and um, constantly uh, try and make the jersey, whether it's a player making the jersey better or whether it's figuratively a, a, a management member um, making the jersey bigger uh, and better. That's our job, and and so the specialness never leaves. It's, it's, it's always a challenge. There's always that um, motivation to to learn, to get better, to share, um, to help others within the environment. Um, that's what it's all about. So yeah, I don't think I don't think it gets any easier or any less special over time. Looking back on everything, and I know you're probably pretty focused, as you say, on this weekend. But have you had time to think about? what you want your legacy as part of the All Blacks to be? I mean, how you'd want to be remembered in terms of your involvement with this team? Um, yeah, it's, it's always been the same for me in that, you know, when I played, um, I, saw, I, I knew pretty early on I wasn't going to be a great of the game. You know, I was, I was a pretty good player, but I was really driven to be part of a great team and soon came to realise that you can do that as long as you give everything you got and you, and um, and you work hard at that. Um, you can be part of a great team, and so I found the same as a coach. You know, you just got to you, you've got to give all that you've got and be as good as you can be and learn as much as you can to contribute to to what is a great team. And so that's all I've ever tried to do, probably. And just just finally, uh, I know you'll obviously be. A, other benefactors to your departure, most notably your family. You're someone that's in the spotlight a lot, and I guess your family has had to sacrifice a lot as a result. How are they feeling about getting a getting their husband and a and a father back and those <laughs> sorts of things? Yeah, I think Trish is pretty. My wife Trish is pretty um, excited uh, by the future. Um, my boys have that, that, they've they've always been a huge part of of my career, and they've loved what I've done, and um, they're hugely passionate about teams that I've coached. So um, I don't know how it's going to affect them. They probably want me to keep going. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> like any uh, sons and wives, eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, as I said before, I know it's right, and um, we're ready for it. So it's going to be pretty exciting next chapter. And um, 
Just finally tonight, two former US presidents have taken veiled swipes at their successor, Donald Trump. Barack Obama addressed a rally in Richmond, Virginia, where he was campaigning on behalf of the Democratic candidate for state governor, Ralph Northern. He warned that politics in the US have been set back half a century, describing the country under Donald Trump as angry, divided and nasty. Meanwhile, former Republican President George W. Bush also went on the, on the attack. We become the heirs of Martin Luther King Jr. by recognizing one another not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This means that people of every race, religion, ethnicity can be fully and equally American. It means that bigotry or white supremacy in any form is blasphemy against the American creed. We've seen our discourse degraded by casual cruelty. At times, it can seem like the forces pulling us apart are stronger than the forces binding us together. Argument turns too easily into animosity. Disagreement escalates into dehumanization. We've seen nationalism distorted into nativism. We've forgotten the dynamism that immigration has always brought to America. And that is former Republican President George W. Bush. And that's it from Checkpoint tonight from me, Sharon Brett Kelly, and the team. Have a safe, long weekend. RNZ News headlines at 6.30. Prime Minister-elect Jacinda Ardern will finalise specific ministerial portfolios with New Zealand First over the weekend after announcing the 16-member Labour Cabinet this afternoon. The Primary Teachers Union says most teachers will be relieved if Labour implements its education policies, such as getting rid of national standards. The Queenstown Lakes District Council says a proposed crackdown on Airbnb could free up thousands of flats for long-term rental. And Helicopters are fighting a large fire that's already ripped through a thousand hectares near Tiano. Next news and weather is at seven. <laughs> These stock all live on Mangarara Station. All opportunities for creating productivity. Our story there is earth care, people care, and fair share. We want to plant a whole lot more food producing trees. The people care is obviously.